Welcome back to Wyoming College's online lecture series, Classic Literature and the Virtue of Hope. The title for this, our fifth lecture, is For Hope Would Be Hope for the Wrong Thing, Optimism and the Nineteenth Century. My name is Dr. John Free. Thank you for joining us. In what do men place their hope? This is the question we have been considering during the course of our lecture series. Homer's Odysseus hopes to return home to his wife and son and the people of Ithaca over whom he rules. Virgil's Aeneas hopes to found in Italy a new homeland for his people. Dante's pilgrim hopes to climb the mountain of delight. And the characters of late Shakespeare, as we saw in the last lecture, hope to roll away the stone from death's tomb and live in the new hope of eternal life. In our considerations, we have looked at natural hope, the disposition to believe that all things will turn out for the best. We have looked also at epic hope, which moved classical heroes to strive after future goods, assisted by powers outside themselves. And we have looked finally at supernatural hope, the theological virtue which allows us to believe in the possibility of redemption. We turn our attention now to the 19th century, a time of great ambivalence with respect to hope. On the one hand, there is great optimism, optimism in the progress of society and of industry, optimism in the growth of the democratic process and the rule of law, optimism in the seemingly uninterrupted march towards new freedoms, freedom from slavery, for example, freedom from political tyranny, even freedom from poverty. But beneath this surface of optimism remains a nagging sense that those things in which we place our trust will not, in the end, satisfy the deepest yearnings of the human heart. In words from St. Augustine that we heard in a previous lecture, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, Lord. The poets of the age, this age recognize the restlessness, if not the remedy, and their recognition disturbs the century's apparent self-confidence. The period it begins with a love song to the natural world, the response of the romantics to a previous age made cold by an undue reliance on reason. But as the century progresses, the love song itself grows cold, choked in part by new commodities and comforts, the offspring of the industrial age, which offer the hope of an earthly paradise for the greatest number of people. The revolutions of mid-century seek a worldwide unification of workers against capitalists who they say are intent on maximizing production and profit. The theory of communism points to another earthly paradise that will, it argues, come about through an equitable distribution of wealth and a distant future when the state itself will wither away. This false hope vies with others equally false. The dream of empire, for example, that drives the European powers to expand and consolidate their global dominions, often at great human cost. Or closer to home, the dream of American exceptionalism which sometimes moves beyond a healthy patriotism into a realm or region of questionable nationalism. As we approach our own time, there continues to fade from human consciousness a hope in any world apart from this one. God is dead, Nietzsche famously proclaims, and religion, according to Marx, is an opiate of the people, a drug. In what follows, I will attempt to trace, at least in outline form, what becomes of hope in the 19th century, how it is fractured and dissipated, how its object becomes manifold, clouded, and confused, how the high water of supernatural hope that appears in Dante and late Shakespeare increasingly ebbs into isolated pools from which few people drink. I will present such an outline in and through some of the century's representative poetry. There is not enough time to dwell on more than a few poems, but I encourage you through your own reading to see for yourself whether what I say is valid. A good resource is the Norton Anthology of Poetry, which has 
more than 30 poets from the 19th century. I will begin with T.S. Eliot, a poet closer to our own time, yet who somehow stands apart from time. He is prophetic in the sense that he often discerns the grand movements of history and crystallizes them in a telling phrase. I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope, for hope would be hope of the wrong thing. The context of these lines makes clear the meaning. Coming as they do in East Coker, written in 1940, one or two years into the Second World War, and they're also the second part of Four Quartets, the poem speaker reflects on the inescapable reality of death and on the restlessness of men who attempt to distract themselves from it. But there can be no distraction. Listen to Eliot's words. Oh, dark, 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 they all go into the dark, the vacant interstellar spaces, the vacant into the vacant, the captains, merchant bankers, eminent men of letters, the generous patrons of art, the statesmen and the rulers, distinguished civil servants, chairmen of many committees, industrial lords and petty contractors, all go into the dark. Here at work is what I have called in the previous lecture the iron law of nature. We are born, grow to maturity, decline, and eventually die. All without exception go into the dark. Therefore, any mere natural hope that thinks things will turn out for the best is hope for the wrong thing. You will recall also from a previous lecture philosopher Joseph Pieper and his claim that, strictly speaking, Hope is only hope when it is supernatural, a gift from God that allows us to trust in the promise of eternal life. Anything less than this supernatural hope is not really hope at all, or hope only in an analogous sense. And in the face of that death, which is an essential fact of the human condition, all other hopes so-called are the wrong kind of hope, again, because they hope for the wrong thing. It is worth here reviewing from an earlier lecture what Pieper says about the human condition. Man, he says, is a creature on the way, homo viator, a pilgrim, if you will, bound for a destination he cannot reach on his own. He lives in the state of not yet, the status viatoris, the state of one who still journeys. This was and remains a principal truth of our Judeo-Christian heritage, and it is interesting to reflect on just how frequently Scripture hammers the point home. In Hebrews, St. Paul refers to his Jewish ancestors as strangers and pilgrims on earth. He says later in the same letter, we have here no lasting city. St. Peter calls his listeners sojourners and pilgrims, while Jesus says of his followers that the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Strangers, pilgrims, sojourners. None of these terms is an empty metaphor. On the contrary, each is a realistic appraisal of our human condition. Now, what happens when a culture loses sight of this truth? The answer is writ large in the poetry of the age. From its romantic beginnings to the work of the late Victorians, the mainstream of 19th century verse moves between the shores of hope and despair. But the hope is mostly natural. Moreover, even as natural hope, it is often unwarranted or misplaced. In its more confident mood, the poetry of the age speaks the language of exaltation and triumph. It champions the power of man to accomplish great things. Its negative, negative counterpart sounds the eternal note of sadness of which Matthew Arnold writes. If a culture ignores or rejects the condition of man as homo viator, a poor wayfaring stranger, to quote the popular folk song, men and women end up putting greater emphasis on natural happiness and consequently suffer greater agonies when the hope for such happiness is inevitably thwarted. 
This is precisely what happens in the 19th century. I mentioned just now that the century's poetry moves between the shores of natural hope and despair. We see this, first of all, in the work of the Romantics, <clears throat> a period that runs roughly between 1790 and 1830. The poetry of Wordsworth and Coleridge, Keats and Shelley strikes us with its breathtaking beauty. The poems often lift the human spirit. They speak of wonder and imagination, of natural grandeur and new horizons. In his Auguries of Innocence, the proto-romantic poet William Blake invites us to, quote, see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Along similar lines, William Wordsworth continues this love song for the natural world. For I have learned to look on nature, he writes in Tintern Abbey, and I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air. And then there is John Keats, who dies of tuberculosis at 25, and who would equate beatitude itself with the herd beauty of a nightingale's song. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy, that from his famous ode to a nightingale. For all their soaring flights of lyric beauty, all their initial optimism for the revolutionary spirit of the age and the fresh winds of human freedom that blow across Europe, the Romantics also manifest a palpable despair, both about themselves and about mankind in general. There is some missing key to the mystery of life, but as we see in his Intimations of Immortality Ode, Wordsworth fails in his effort adequately to name it. There was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth and every common sight to me did seem appareled in celestial light, the glory and the freshness of a dream. It is not now as it hath been of yore, turn wheresoe'er I may, by night or day, the things which I have seen I now can see no more. In the same poem, Wordsworth goes on to say significantly that there has passed a glory from the earth. The conclusion of the ode attempts to identify some species of hope, but it is certainly not the supernatural hope that points to eternal life. It is rather, as the title says, only an intimation of immortality, something nondescript, rooted not in God, but in the natural world, or in some vague, human quality, what the poet calls primal sympathy or the philosophic mind. In an effort to salvage something like hope, Wordsworth writes, though nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass or glory in the flower, we will grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind. But with respect to natural goods, what remains behind, indeed, what can remain? St. John writes, the world is passing away along with its desires. Wordsworth appears to acknowledge the same, but without a spirit of acceptance. He wants to cling to something, anything, though what he grasps is ultimately slippery. With his fellow romantics, he longs for what is unchanging and permanent, like the static beauty of Keats' Grecian urn. But he tries to locate the permanent in that which is passing. We see a similar grasping for permanence at work in Ulysses, a mid-century poem written about 1833 by Alfred Lord Tennyson. The poem's aging speaker contends, though much is taken, much abides, which again raises the question, what abides, what remains? As it turns out, only a false optimism, only a faux hope. It is worth listening to the poem in its entirety. 
It little profits that an idle king by this sad hearth among these barren crags, matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly have suffered greatly, both with those that loved me and alone. On shore, and when through scudding drifts, the rainy Hyades vex the dim sea, I am become a name. For always roaming with a hungry heart, much have I seen and known, cities of men, and manners, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honored of them all, and drunk delight of battle with my peers far on the, on the ringing plains of windy Troy. I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world, whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use, as though to breathe were life. Life piled on life were all too little, and of one to me little remains, but every hour is saved from that eternal silence, something more, a bringer of new things. And vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself, and this gray yearning in spirit in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. This is my son, mine own Telemachus, to whom I leave the scepter and the isle. Well loved of me, <clears throat> discerning to fulfill this labor by slow prudence to make wild a rugged people and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good. Most blameless is he, centered in the sphere of common duties, decent not to fail in offices of tenderness, and pay meet adoration to my household gods. He works his work, I mine. There lies the port, the vessel puffs her sail. There gloom the dark broad seas, my mariners, souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me, that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts, free foreheads. You and I are old. Old age hath yet his honor and his toil. Death closes something, yet something ere the end, some work of noble note may yet be done. Not unbecoming men that strove with gods, the lights begin to twinkle from the rocks, the long day wanes. The slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. Push off and sitting well in order smite the sounding furrows, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of the western stars until I die. It may be that gulfs will wash us down it may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that, with stre that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will. To strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. The poem is subtle in its power to move us, no, to rouse our spirits. After all, how can we not admire an aging man who still wishes to drink life to the lees, or follow knowledge like a sinking star, or accomplish at life's end some work of noble note? We don't come upon too many old men or women like that, but it is a delight when we find one. In Ulysses, however, one also detects an unhealthy restlessness an inclination towards activism, which is one of the ailments of our own time. He tells us that he cannot rest from travel, is always roaming with a hungry heart. Why does he see his present state in life as being without profit? Why does he speak disparagingly of his aged wife, of the savage race he rules, 
and of his son Telemachus, whose virtues he damns with faint praise. Is there not something selfish in the desire to leave wife, family, and kingdom in order to sail beyond the sunsets and the baths of the western stars? And when all is said and done, what is the real purpose of his voyage? Ulysses tells us that he desires a knowledge beyond the utmost bound of human thought. Is this not the fond dream of both the Renaissance and the Enlightenment? that man is capable of knowing all things and should therefore accept no limitations on the range or scope of his knowledge. When in Milton's Paradise Lost, the character of Adam presses for a more than human knowledge, the angel Raphael chides him. Be lowly wise, he says, think only what concerns thee and thy being. About his destination, Ulysses further discloses that Tis not too late to seek a newer world. But what is the nature of the world he seeks? It seems only a more perfect version of the present one, something akin, in other words, to the earthly paradises promised by 19th century utopians, by communists and capitalists alike, by architects of empire and apologists for nation, race, or class. We have been trying to understand the purpose of Ulysses' voyage to determine his intended journey's end, but perhaps the question should be otherwise. Reading between the lines, does it have more to do with his point of departure than his destination, what he attempts to leave behind rather than what he travels towards? I would like to suggest that what lies behind the character's restless spirit is a flight from that iron law of nature whose end is death. Ulysses himself speaks of that eternal silence, a vision not of life after death, but rather of annihilation, of nothingness. Consider also the memorable lines which conclude the poem. They are both powerful and troubling, especially with respect to supernatural hope. We are, says Ulysses, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. This is often read as a triumph of the human spirit, perseverance, courage, unyielding. But might it not also embody the spirit of defiance found in a later poet, Dylan Thomas, and his counsel to, quote, rage, rage against the dying of the light? Or may we not hear in Ulysses' words those of Milton's Satan, who boasts, quote, the courage never to submit or yield. The character of Tennyson's Ulysses is a quintessentially modern man. He puts no stock in anything apart from himself. He is autonomous in determining the course of his life. He doubts the existence of anything like divine will, and he rejects or remains agnostic about the possibility of an afterlife. Like Homer's Odysseus, he is a magnanimous or great-souled man, but with this crucial difference. Tennyson's Ulysses believes in the power of man to achieve greatness <clears throat> on his own, without recourse either to God or grace. Homer's Odysseus needs the help of Athena. The hope of Tennyson's Ulysses is purely natural, not epic, as Dr. Arbery previously used the term in connection with Odysseus and Aeneas. Neither is there in Ulysses the slightest hint of supernatural hope, which, as you recall, has as its sole object God and allows for the possibility of eternal life. So the noble-sounding and rousing dreams of Ulysses at the end of the poem fall into Eliot's category of hope for the wrong thing. Other 19th century poets frequently echo what we have already seen in Wordsworth and Tennyson. They travel between the shores of hope and despair with the same restless searching that characterizes Ulysses. On the one hand, William Ernest Henley writes in his Invictus, 1888, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Words almost bristling with a militant optimism. But then we hear the countervailing voice in Thomas Hardy's poem of 10 years later, titled Hap, 1898. 
if but some vengeful God would, I'm sorry, if but some vengeful God would call to me from up the sky and laugh, thou suffering thing, know that thy sorrow is my ecstasy, that thy love's loss is my hate's profiting. Then would I bear it, clench myself, and die. The poem's final stanza answers its own reflection, but not so. And with it, a despairing hearty implicitly acknowledges the same eternal silence present in Tennyson. Perhaps one of the century's most significant poems, significant to my mind, because it traces the movements of the era's thought and feeling, is Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, written in 1867. Allow me to read it for you. The sea is calm tonight, the tide is full, the moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast, out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. Only from a long line of spray where the sea meets the moon-blanched land, listen. You hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand. Begin and cease, and then again begin, with tremulous cadence slow, and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like a full, the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another, for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle or flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. Arnold names the process that has been at work in Europe during the early modern period through the eras of Renaissance, Reformation, and Enlightenment. And he likens Christian faith to an ebbing sea, a retreating sea. He hears this retreat, this melancholy, long withdrawing roar. Melancholy for Arnold, as for many of his contemporaries, perhaps because of the certainty that such faith once afforded. In another poem, he laments the same loss of religious belief, but sees it as a necessary coming of age, the natural development for a culture convinced, as his own 19th century culture increasingly was, that revelation and reason have little in common. For rigorous teachers seized my youth and purged its faith and trimmed its fire, showed me the high white star of truth, there gave, bade me gaze and there aspire. Those are stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse, written about 1850. What's interesting here is that these lines, Arnold points or takes for granted that reason, in his Im image, the high white star of truth, makes faith untenable. Uh, unacceptable. And this is the largely unchallenged nostrum that prevails even in our own time, an idea we will return to in the following lecture. With the retreat of faith, it comes as no surprise that the speaker of Dover Beach can find little on which to rely. In a painful series of negations, he one by one cycles through what men and women of a bygone age once trusted in. Whatever truth, beauty, or goodness the world seemed to have is only to him an illusion. In reality, it has really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. 
and we are here as on a darkling plain. And in the general roll call of these negations, we must also include supernatural hope, for this virtue cannot live in the absence of belief in God, nor with the uncertainty as to whether this God is good or vengeful, to use Hardy's adjective. With what then does Arnold leave us? As it turns out, very little. Ah, love, let us be true to one another, he says. Is there nothing then apart from natural human love on which to base all the hopes of our life? Love for a mortal being destined, like Eliot says, to go into the dark. Here, once more, is the folly of natural hope, which seeks the absolute in the finite, the eternal in the temporal, and ultimately the living among the dead. In the all too brief outline provided, we have begun to see how 19th century culture moves between the opposing shores of hope and despair. Natural hope and the despair that follows when what is hoped for can never satisfy the immortal longings of the human heart. Either they remain unachieved, like Ulysses' untraveled world, whose margin fades forever and forever as he moves towards it, or they are achieved but fail to provide the joy they had promised. Or having been achieved and enjoyed, they do not last. Recall the anguish of Shakespeare's Pericles made wildly happy by the love of wife and daughter, only to lose them both. O oh, you gods, why do you make us love your goodly gifts and snatch them straight away? This is the same story for our own lives, is it not? All our natural goods and joys, however wonderful, do not provide, can never provide, what the psalmist promises. Fullness of joy in your presence delights at your right hand forever. I have noted that this outline is only a beginning. What I've been trying to describe in this lecture is the main thrust of the century's poetry which captures a significant de development occurring throughout the 1800s and continuing into our own time. The false optimism that results from an exclusive reliance on natural hope and the despair that follows when this hope is disappointed. But I don't want to leave you today with the impression that supernatural hope is entirely absent from the poetry of the 19th century. Other poems and poetry from the time John Henry Newman's Dream of Gerontius, 1865, for example, or Francis Thompson's The Hound of Heaven from 1893, or the work of George MacDonald, Christina Rossetti, and Gerard Manley Hopkins, among others, are all deeply suffused with supernatural hope. It's true that these poetic voices constitute what we might call a minority opinion. But because of our own need for supernatural hope, there is all the more reason to heed these voices, voices crying, as it were, in the wilderness of modernity. For theirs is not hope for the wrong thing, but rather hope in eternal life promised before the world began. Let me leave you then with these simple and beautiful words from Souls Rising, a late century poem by George MacDonald. Let us haste upwards from this dreary waste, up where like music flowing, gentler feet are ever going. Streams of life encircling run round about the spirit's sun. Up beyond the storm and rush, with our lesson let us rise. Lo, the morning's golden flush meets us midway in the skies. Perished all the dream and strife. Death is swallowed up of life. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time.